and what's good? Today we're going to talk about the NBA. We've actually talked about college football and football. I want to talk a little bit about the NBA. I do have done some basketball stuff. I like the NBA. Basketball is actually my favorite sport, objectively. But I want to talk about the NBA. There's a lot of things going on. I know it's early in the season. I don't want to talk about the NBA too much. You know, I know I made a lot of football videos. And, you know, maybe I'll make continue to make NBA videos. But right now, I just want to talk about the NBA just for a little bit. I want to talk about each team. Just kind of give a rundown of where they're at. In terms of like, you know, just a quick summary, the Hawks will start off, you know, alphabetically Atlanta. Atlanta is very permissive, right? It's, it's, it's a new year. It's the same old Hawks. They can't guard anybody. Right now, they're 27th in the league in defense, which is the same story they've been for the last, I believe, seven years. I mean, shit, the Wizards, you know, objectively one of the worst teams in basketball, handed the Hawks back-to-back -back losses at the end of October. They averaged like 127 points per game in both those games. I mean, like, that's incredible. Trey Young has been a, a turnstile at the point of attack, and Dyson Daniels isn't good enough to guard everybody. And unless the Hawks are putting together a legitimately historic offense, and they're not, the way their defense is is just going to be the same thing it's been all the time. It's going to be the same story. Next up, Boston, the Boston Celtics. They are, they're indomitable. I mean, no Kristaps Porzingis, no problem. It's crazy to think that Kristaps Porzingis, a player of his caliber, makes this team historically great instead of takes them from good to great. And on top of it, the Celtics seem more motivated than ever. There's no malaise. There's no championship hangover. There's no flipping a switch. I don't know if it's Joe Mazzulla being a fantastic. I'm sure it's a mix of all these things being from Joe Mazzulla, Tatum, and his, obviously, summer kind of being at the end of the bench. Jalen Brown's Olympic snub. Like, I'm sure there's so many different motivations to it, but it's crazy how dominant the Celtics have been. And I was not a Celtics believer until, I would say, sometime during the playoffs last season. I don't remember exactly when. But listen. I'm a Celtics believer. I don't necessarily know if they're going to win at the championship, but they're my favorite to win the East for sure. Next up, I want to talk about the Brooklyn Nets. They're frisky. They're really frisky. They're playing super competitive ball. They're, you know, Dennis Schroeder's having a career renaissance. Offensively, they look really good. Obviously, Cam Thomas has been doing his thing, averaging almost 25 points per game. But again, Dennis Schroeder, he's been averaging, I think, almost 20 points, which is crazy. I think he had 33 against the Grizzlies one game. He's playing fantastic basketball. Cam Johnson's been a reliable three-point shooter. Noah Clowney has started to tap into his upside. Hell, Zaire Williams has looked good. Even the negatives for this team, they foul way too much, is great because it shows that they're trying to play defense. They're, they're flying around. They're active. You know, listen, they're not going to win. They're not going to make the playoffs. They're not going to make the play-in. They're going to pile up losses. And a lot of these guys are going to be shipped out. But hey, it's fun. It's competitive. And that's what matters. The Charlotte Hornets, they're progressing. Obviously, LaMilla Ball has continued a career ascent over the last five years. But he's been hurt, you know, for the better part of the last two years. But he's healthy. Still only 23, he's picked up right where he left off. He's averaging 29, five rebounds, six assists. His efficiency is at a career high, and his three-point rate and his free throw rate are at career highs. Like, he is playing his best basketball. They score 19 points per, per 100 possession. I'm reading it right here. More when he's on the floor than when he's on the bench. And listen, you know, he's missed, again, the better part of the last two years. But with him on the floor, him at the helm, the Hornets are playing great basketball. Next up, the Bulls. You know, the Bulls, they should feel satisfied in a weird way. They were Obviously, everybody wants them to trade the vets, and I don't disagree with that. If you want to tear it down, you want to capture the flag, got to do it. However, if you trade guys for pennies on the dollar, that's where things get, get dicey, and that's what Levine was going to be if they traded him, you know, in the past. However, Levine, he's averaging 26, 6, and 3 assists. On, I'm reading right now, 55, 46, 82 splits. Listen. He's not, you're not going to get a crazy package back because his contract, I'm looking at it right here, three years, 138. But listen, at least now you don't have to give up first round picks to get off him. Maybe, you know, again, at the end of the day, they should have torn this down a while ago. But listen, keeping him instead of selling him for pennies was a great decision. The Cavs, they're optimized. They're 9-0. Kenny Atkinson has done wonders with this team. And it's not like they play bums. Again, you think you might have the same flaws as last year, but Atkinson's rotations have been good. He's really got the team to, to cohere, like to coerce. I don't know what the hell this is, but they're really cohesive. And he, his X's and O's are incredible. Again, they're really healthy, but Evan Mobley's more aggressive on offense. He's a driver. He's a passer. Yeah, Mobley has been involved on almost every action when he's on the floor. Donovan Mitchell and Mobley are the pair. They play almost every minute on the floor together. And Karis LeVert, you know, he's a, he's a reserve. He comes off the bench for that team, but he has played fantastic ball under Kenny Atkinson. Everyone thought that at the end of the day, they'd have to trade, you know, because they have the two guards, the two small guards and the two bigs, that they'd have to shake it up and kind of like get more of a traditional roster. But listen, all, you know, all the signs right now show that they just needed a better coach. The Mavericks are gargantuan. That's a weird word to describe the Dallas Mavericks. They haven't really leaned on the oversized lineups that they've had. They play Spencer Dimity and Kyrie Irving a lot in their most used lineups. But when they want, they can get huge. 
One of the lineups here, I'm going to read it right now, it was Luca, Najee Marshall, Clay Thompson, PJ Washington, and Daniel Gafford. I think the smallest guy on the floor is Clay Thompson at 6'6, six, 6'7, six, six, maybe Najee Marshall or Luca. They have a plus minus of 91.1. That is obviously unsustainable, but teams cannot score because every one of them can defend. And even if they can't, Luka's not necessarily known as a great defender. He's positionally huge. Even so, there are so many different lineups they can play. Obviously, we have Gafford, Derek Lively. They can throw Maxi Kleba in there. And on top of it, on the wings, you obviously have Luka. You have P.J. Washington. You have Najee Marshall. You have Clay Thompson. In Luka's 6'7", 230, if he's the smallest player on the floor, you're going to dominate positional size matchups. And against the Celtics... You know how they're huge, Tatum, Brown, obviously Derek White and Drew Holiday aren't as big as Luka and Clay Thompson, but they're bigger guards. The positional size for the for the Mavericks in a potential match up against the Celtics and teams like that are huge. The Nuggets are two-faced. And listen, the Denver Nuggets have been the same team for the last eight years. When Jokic is on the floor, they're fantastic. When he's off the floor, they're terrible. Unfort unfortunately for Denver, good Denver and bad Denver is just getting farther and farther apart. With Jokic in the game, they're outscoring opponents by almost 10 points per possession. 100 possessions, excuse me, that's not possible. With him on the bench, they're getting outscored by 25.6 points per 100 possessions. That's a 35.2 points per possession swing. That's unreadable. That's unreal. But at the end of the day, it's not uncommon. Last year, the gap was 20 points. During the championship run, it was 23. Obviously, you've lost Bruce Brown, Jeff Green, Kentavious Caldwell-Pope. You really can't afford injuries. Aaron Gordon is out. But Denver has to figure out a way, or or Jokic just has to play 48 minutes a game. or You know what I mean? Like, he just has to, because this gap needs to get smaller, not bigger. The Detroit Pistons, they look settled. Jaden Ivey looks much better this season, especially playing next to Cade Cunningham. Looking at it here, he's averaging 24 assists on 47, 39, 76 shooting splits. And when Cade Cunningham's on the bench, he's the lead playmaker. His shooting has always been a question mark, but his efficiency has obviously gone up, and he's not just taking you know, one or two threes. He's really letting it fly. He's hitting 52% of his catch-and-shoot threes. That was 36% 30, uh, last year, and that was good. Now it's great. He just looks like a more complete, more competent, renewed player. He's attacking the rim viciously. And the backcourt of the Pistons' future appears to be settled, which was a lot of people's questions coming into this season. Next up, the surprise Golden State Warriors. I'm going to call them frenetic. We're going to talk about Brandon Pojamski. He is among the NBA lead leaders in plus minus. And it's not because he's shooting the ball at a crazy clip. He's played 197 minutes at a plus 100 because he's creating havoc on the defensive side of the floor. They're flying around like they haven't in years. They're creating turnovers, taking charges, pushing the pace, creating chaos in ways that seem so different from the team that we saw last year. A lot of that has to do with Brandon Pajamski. I mean, he leads the league in charges drawn to actually tie with Draymond Green. So shout out to Draymond Green. He dives on the floor set like multiple times. Like if you turn on a game, there will be a chance you'll see him dive on the floor. And he flies around. Obviously, Gary Payton is there as well, but he's really leading and the rest of the Warriors are doing the exact same thing. Obviously, the Warriors are really deep now, which is kind of an interesting thing to say because they have De'Anthony Melton, they brought in Buddy Heald, they brought in Kyle Anderson, and that's super important. But the biggest difference to this team is the style in which they play basketball, especially on the defensive side. And for the Rockets, it's oversaturated. And it's, you know, the Rockets, they have kind of two different groups of players on this team. You have the vets that kind of lean in and they kind of lead the team and they help stabilize everything. And then you have the young guys that are learning to play NBA basketball and are still developing. And this wouldn't be that big of a problem if there wasn't so many guys that needed minutes, right? Fred Van Fleet, his on-off numbers have been atrocious this season. He has not played well. Even if you want him to be traded, you can't really risk benching him because then you strip his entire trade value. At the end of the day, you need to keep playing him, hoping he'll figure it out. And if you really want to trade him, you use that as an opportunity to build his value back up. But again, you have so many guys that need minutes and, and too many guys that are in the way. But you need to figure out who's worth keeping, who's worth trading, because like obviously... I mean, we've seen games where Tari Eason takes over entire halves. So obviously, Amen Thompson can guard Luka Doncic as well as anybody else can. Jalen Green scores like a superstar. Jabari Smith is a Walmart Kevin Durant. Uh, again, I'm just, I can't think of a better comp off the top of my head. Who plays good defense? And, like, obviously, you just paid Jalen Green. You paid Alper and Shengun. You just need to figure out who is worth keeping and, like, having some of these. You just have so many guys on the fucking roster. This stems a bigger problem. The NBA, you need to expand. We need to expand. Put one in Seattle. Put one in Vegas. Boom. The Indiana Pacers are very familiar, right? We've seen this movie before. In 2021, 2022, I've been saying this. The Atlanta Hawks, Trey Young, leads them to a surprise Eastern Conference Finals run. Last year, Tyrese Halliburton leads a surprise Eastern Conference Finals run to the Indiana Pacers. The Hawks won 43 games that next year and haven't won anything close to that since. In Indy, I've been saying it, they look very similar to that team. And it's not, you know, it's not set in stone, but it's very jarring to see the offense from this season compared to last season and how different it is. 
They were the second best offense last year, and they're like a league average team. Tyrese Halliburton is still not the same player. Andrew Nemhard has struggled, and there's very little to 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 suspect or to make me believe that you're gonna get back up to this level. Every like a breakthrough is is hard, right? Reaching this level is hard, and I want to shout out the Pacers for doing it. But when you get here, the hardest part is staying here. The Lakers, obviously, they've been in the show for a while. They're floundering. It's gonna be tough to see how good DJ Redick is as a coach because I mean, first of all, I'm not. He has done so many good things. Playing through Anthony Davis, the defense is there. He doesn't take shit. He fucking pulled Delo's bitch ass. I actually don't have a problem with Delo. I don't know why I said that. But he pulled Delo's ass when he felt like he wasn't giving effort. He, he's not taking any shit, which is really good. And he's really trying to set his culture and he's really trying to set an example. But it leads to believe how good is this team really, right? Like, is this a play a play in team, a playoff team? Is it a top four seed if, if things break right? Can this team go to an NBA finals? I mean, obviously, you have Anthony Davis and LeBron James. So, you know, maybe. Because betting against LeBron James is is just a fool's errand at this point. I think J.J. Redick will get this team to its peak, or at least as high as its potential can be, barring injuries. But how high is that potential really? Right? They started off 3-0. They leaned on AD. Austin Reeves looked much better. But then they've gone on this road trip, and they're giving up transition buckets like this. And they look really old, slow, unathletic, unable to keep up, especially on defense. The first week of the season, everything looked amazing. But since then... It's like a mirage. Let's talk about the other LA team. They're handsy, right? The LA Clippers are feisty, handsy. They're a tough cover. Everybody thought that James Harden was going to have to play like the old James Harden, like Houston James Harden. He's been really, you know, he's led a heliocentric offense, but they're averaging, I'm looking at it here, 110 points per 100 possessions. That's a bottom 10 figure in the, in the NBA. What's really kept them in games is their defense. They're really disruptive. They're really, uh, that's why I said handsy. They're really into opposing teams. They're really disruptive. They scramble a lot around. They make life uncomfortable for other teams. And listen, that, this is not just everybody but James Harden. Obviously, James Harden is not, you know, a defensive lockdown player. James Harden logged four, I'm not fucking with you. I watched the possession, four deflections on a single possession against the San Antonio Spurs. The fact that none of those turned into a steal, kind of unreal. However, still, he's everywhere. They're seventh league-wide in deflections and eighth in loose balls recovered per game. And they're a top 10 team in defensive efficiency. Now, this team is going to win a championship unless Kawhi Leonard becomes the best player in basketball or James Harden is gets back to the offensive level he was. But listen, this team is nowhere near as bad as most people think. And if you told me this team in the playoffs as like an eight seed sneaks in, I wouldn't be shocked. Next up, the Memphis Grizzlies. They are a resourceful-ass team. Last year, they set the NBA record for different starting lineups in terms of how many guys were in there at least once. And it seems like it helped their talent evaluation team, or I don't know how the process is for the NBA roster, but their talent evaluation is incredible. This season alone, they've they've brought in multiple guys. They've just found these gems. Like we think about the Miami Heat doing that, and the Miami Heat do, but Memphis, they've done it a lot in the last two years. One of the guys we're going to talk about, Jay Huff. He was a, a two-way player. He's come in, they, uh, excuse me, they transitioned his contract into a traditional contract. He's a stud. He's a 7-1 center. If you don't know who he is, he's got a reliable three-point shot. Opening week, he put up 20 points in 14 minutes over the Sixers. Listen, he's done enough. Obviously, he's ended his journeyman days. He's on a traditional contract here with the Memphis Grizzlies. He split 31 games between three total teams, Lakers, Wizards, and um, Nuggets in the last three seasons. But it seems like he's found a home with the Grizzlies. And I, the Grizzlies, again, we not even to talk about Vince Williams and Gigi Jackson last year. But what they have done in, their, in Memphis is incredible. Next up, the Miami Heat, they're confusing as shit. I don't understand the Miami Heat at all. Bayam Metabio has not made an offensive leap. He hadn't scored more than a dozen points in a single game until he had 32 against the, the worst ranked defense in basketball in Washington and Mexico City. It, it was a very interesting trend to see Bam almost regress. Um, if you watched any of the Team USA basketball, he showed off, you know, potential range in the Olympics. The Heat have struggled to score in the last, you know, I don't know, five years. So it, it felt more like, bam, okay, if he's going to do this here, he's definitely going to come out in Miami when there's, you know, theoretically less talent around him and, and just launch that bitch. But he's averaging his fewest points and fewest free throw attempts since, I believe, 2019-20. So the bubble. The Heat have been okay because Rozier is finally healthy and Tyler Hero are letting their letting threes fly left, right, and center, and they're hitting them all. I think they're both, yeah, they're both getting eight three-pointers up a game at 43%. I mean, that's crazy. That's great efficiency. But it's hard to understand, like, with Jimmy Butler slowing, Jimmy Butler is slowing down. He's not a superstar anymore. I hate to break it to you if you think he is. He's just not. But Miami, like, they need more offense, and Bam is functioning like a four. So I don't know if that's Spolstra, if that's Bam. I don't really understand what's going on. I don't think it's Spolstra. It's just something that's got to change. I want to be wrong on this next one. I really do. My wallet does, too. But the Milwaukee Bucks are finished. It's over. They're cooked. This iteration of Milwaukee is done. The Bucks are not a contender anymore, and they don't have an avenue to do so, at least not one that I can see. 
the Dame card was the last card to play, and it just hasn't paid off. Dame has not been bad. Giannis, again, is still the best player in basketball, arguably the best player in basketball. But the, the synergy between them is just still not there. And Doc Rivers, listen, man, it's over. Doc Rivers, get back to ESPN. Get, get, it's over. It's over. Adrian Griffin, they were 30 and 13. They fired him. Doc Rivers has done nothing since then. They don't have any first round picks besides the 2031, 30, 2031 first round pick to trade. They face every strict limitation of the second apron. So there's no way out of this in a short rebuild. Really, the only way to do this is trade Giannis. The Bucks are finished. The Minnesota Timberwolves are uncommitted. Not in a bad way. Well, yeah, kind of in a bad way, but not in like the way you're thinking I'm saying. The Minnesota Timberwolves are not doing either of these things. They're not getting back in transition, and they're not crashing the offensive glass. Somehow, they're managing to do neither, and that, that loses you games, folks. You can't do neither and win games. Obviously, adjustments, they were bound to happen. You make that trade um, for Julius Randle and Dante DiVincenzo right before the season starts. But the 25th, I'm reading here, 25th in offensive rebound rate and 26th in opponent transition frequency, which means they're not getting offensive rebounds and opponents are getting out on the break and scoring on them like this. Most teams do one or the other. Most teams, traditionally, they just fall back in transition, don't allow quick buckets, but they're not doing either of these things. And, and, and maybe this is objectively just the symptom of having a roster who that is massive. They're not really athletic outside of Anthony Edwards, but it doesn't excuse poor offensive rebounding. You have Rudy Gobert, you have Julius Randle, you have Nas Reed. Anthony Edwards is a great rebounder for a guard. Don, so is Dante DiVincenzo. You have Jaden McDaniels. If you're not going to get back in transition, again, you are a very old, lumbering team. Rudy Gobert is not, you know, he's not fast. Mike Conley is like 40 years old. You got to do something. The Pelicans, they're beloggered. They're beloggered with injuries. Trey Murphy started the season on the on the sideline. DeJounte Murray is now hurt. Herb Jones and CJ McCollum are now hurt. And the worst one, Zion is hurt. They didn't have a first string center anyways. You know, you, you didn't know who was going to be Daniel Tice or Yves Misi. You really couldn't afford to lose any of these pieces, let alone all of them. And the problem is these injuries aren't allowing the Pelicans to see how this roster should play. If you don't have your full roster, you don't know how good you really are. And it's really tough to sit here and say you should make a trade, but you don't know if you're good enough to make a trade or bad enough to make a trade. Because you don't know if there's enough shooting and secondary playmaking around Zion because all of the guys that you brought in to do those things aren't playing. And at the end of the day, it's just so tough to, to get a gauge on this roster because of these injuries. And you hope everybody comes back healthy, obviously. But you, you got to feel for the Pelicans front office. The Knicks, they're generous. They're scoring at a very high clip. And it's good because they're not stopping a fucking nosebleed. Through the first six games, New York, I'm reading here, allowed the first, excuse me, the highest effective field goal percentage in the league, which means they're the, theoretically the worst defense in basketball on a Tom Thibodeau team. And okay, you know, they played the Celtics the first game and they got lit up for 33s. So, you know, you're only in a small sample size, three-point variances, things like that. Not necessarily the best time to trust the analytics when the sample size is so small. The problem is, it's not just three-point shooting. They're giving up way too many easy looks around the basket. I'm looking at it right here. They're converting opponents of the Knicks are converting shots within six feet of the basket at an 83.83% point, clip. That's five out of six when Cat is the nearest defender. Cat is 6'11", seven feet tall. That's fucking unreal. Mikhail Bridges, Josh Hart, OJ Ananobi, all the rates when they're the primary defender within six feet of the rim, 70%. That's, that's, you know what I mean? That's unreal. If you can't stop three pointers and shots at the rim on defense, you're going to get killed all season. The Thunder are predatory. And no, they traded away Josh Giddey, so that's not what I'm talking about. The Oklahoma City Thunder on defense are causing opponents so much havoc. They're, they have a, like a 30-year a defense. That doesn't even make sense what I just said. I'm so flustered. I wrote down notes here, so I'm trying to read it while I'm talking to you guys. But essentially, it's been almost 30 years since a team caused as much chaos on defense as the Oklahoma City Thunder. 30 years. We're talking 94. Michael Jordan was still in the league when this shit was happening. Caruso, Shea, Lou Dort, J-Dub. They are relentless at the point of attack. And you have Chet Holmgren flanking you. The 97-98 Celtics were the last team to top the Oklahoma City Thunder's turnover percentage. And that team ran a full-court press under Rick Pitino. That should tell you how long ago that was. And Boston only got 36 wins. I'm going to be willing to bet they'll get more than that. And this team doesn't even have Isaiah Hartenstein. This team doesn't have... This team is playing pretty much Chet at the 5. Hartenstein was brought in to be the 5, so Chet could be the 4. Could you imagine those lineups with Chet's lanky-ass arms picking people's pockets? That's unreal. They're going to get the best defense in the league. It's really going to be how much better are they going to be than every other team in the last 25 years. The Orlando Magic, they're disrupted, right? Obviously, last year they had a great season. They pushed the Cavs to seven games in the first time they were in the playoffs in I don't know how long. Paul Bancaro comes out and he scores 50 in the first week of the season and then gets hurt. They were playing offense at you know a league average level, which for them, they were 22nd in offense last year. I think they were 15th before Paul got hurt. 15th? You'll take it. At least for now, you want to build up higher. But right now, that you know that's a step in the right direction. And they have elite defense. So at the end of the day, elite defense with a you know a good enough offense 
In the East, you tell me Paulo Banquero takes another step, you're not a top four seed. The problem is he's their primary scorer. So now he's out, you're putting a lot of scoring burden on a lot of other guys. And maybe Jalen Hurts, not Jalen Hurts, Jalen Suggs, excuse me, can take another leap. He's obviously looked great, but if he can continue to develop, this is going to put more guys in uncomfortable positions. Franz Wagner is obviously going to have to be an alpha now. Anthony Black maybe takes a leap, takes more of a, a role in this offense. But even if all of those things happen, Orlando's still going to miss Paul Boncaro, and, and it just, it's just disappointing, dispiriting. He's going to come back, right? But you really hope to take this, like, have a major leap this year. And it looks like it's going to be put on hold. The Sixers are undefined. We don't know what the fuck the Sixers are. Embiid hasn't played. Paul George finally played. Maxie's been out there playing hero ball. Embiid's assaulting reporters. Embiid, I stand with Embiid. He deserved to do that. That reporter, get the fuck out of there for saying some shit about your brother and your son. Get the fuck out of there. But... Embiid's injury history, we know about it. Paul George hasn't exactly been the beacon of health, but he's playing. Maxie's been great. It may it may take legitimately take months to see this team at full strength. Not necessarily full strength, because Embiid's going to be back, but more of like full chemistry, kind of see how everything flows together. Assuming the Sixers make the playoffs, because they're 1-5, in 1-4 in four right now. I don't exactly know what their record is right at the top of my head, um, but I don't have it off in front of me. I'm not going to pull it up. But you, we really may not see this full Sixers team in terms of what their potential is until the playoffs. And, and you hope that things kind of coalesce soon but if not you're looking at a very scary season the phoenix suns distant and you're probably like what distant from a championship no they're shooting shots at, at like a historic rate from away from the rim they haven't graded lower than sixth in mid-range attempts per team since 2019 2020 so they're really not getting the rim. they're taking they're relying a lot on jump shooting and skill work and it's a it's a trend that's stuck around through coaching changes so that's all player personnel Obviously, your more your most efficient offense is going to have a diet of mid-range jump shots, but you want to get to the rim and you want to shoot three-pointers. Anything in between is theoretically ineffective unless you're shooting at an elite clip. Now you have Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, two of the best mid-range shooters in basketball, but they're launching threes this season. Yep, they're sixth in three-point frequency. The last three years, they were 19th, 18th, and 25th. But the rim, they're ranking. They rank dead last in at rim shot percentage. They occupied that spot three times since 2020, 2021, which is the year they went to the finals. The issue isn't the fact that they're not getting to the rim. It's the it's like the extremity of it. They're only they're shooting less than a third of their shots at the rim, which means they're shooting over two thirds of their shots between eight feet and you know full court. You have Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Bradley Beal. Theoretically, you can rely on that, but you gotta somehow get to the rim at a higher clip. If you can push that at rim frequency to forty, ideally fifty, you're in a great spot. The Portland Trailblazers, they're emerging. If you're not paying attention, you better start. Obviously, their roster is very win now. When later you have like these groups, guys, I'm on one end of the spectrum or the other. But Scoot Henderson is making all these little baby step gains. Tamani Kamara, if you told me he was an all defense player five out of the next 12 years, wouldn't be shocked. Obviously, Henderson's growth is, is the most important thing. And he's looked, you know, better as the season's gone on, much better than last year. And he's been coming off the bench. Um, you assume that they're doing that because they want to, you know, boost Anthony Simon's trade value, who he's played great. Henderson's getting to the line at a higher clip. He's getting a much higher percentage of his shots at the rim. And his true shooting percentage is much higher. He was 49% true shooters last year, true shooting percentage last year. That was the worst among high value shooters. So he was legitimately the worst shooter in basketball last season. There's there's a lot to be seen. They, the Blazers, again, have too many events. Jeremy Grant needs to get the fuck out of there. You need to get Aiton out of there. Uh, Simon's got to go get him to Orlando, man. Get him to Orlando. But you're seeing the the, the steps from the young guys, and, and that's what's important. The Sacramento Kings are balanced in a weird way. You never know how this team is going to be. That was they were, they've been super offensive heavy the last couple of years, and their only signing, their only big name signing this past season was DeMar DeRozan, who's definitely not a lockdown defender. But the defense has been much better, right? And, and obviously the offense, we knew it was going to be good. Keon Ellis can only guard one person. He's a stud. But the starting five of Kevin Herter, De'Aaron Fox, DeMar DeSimone, Keegan Murray, and DeMar DeRozan, they're just outside the top 10 in defensive efficiency through the first part of the season. This isn't luck either. They're shooting, opponents are shooting 38% from three against the Spud Kings, and that's not necessarily like an elite defensive number. And they're hitting over 50% of their long mid-range shots, which, you know, if things equalize, that'll, be, that'll help them, the Kings, much better. But the Kings' effort on defense is much better. If they can keep it at this level, again, I don't think this team is even necessarily a playoff lock, let alone a championship contender. But listen, you play at this level. We saw this team go to the playoffs two seasons ago. They were a three seed. If you told me this team in the playoffs competing this well on defense with the offense that they already have, I wouldn't be shocked. The Spurs, are, the, the Spurs are searching, and this is not something I expected to say about this team at all. I didn't necessarily think this would be a playoff team or a team like, you know, destined for some big leap, but Victor Wembanyama scoring via assist less this season than last season. Last season, he had a literal terrorist as his point guard for the first half of the season. That's not true. Jeremy Summon is not a terrorist, but 
Everybody thought Chris Paul coming in would essentially mean the beginning of spoon-fed baskets for him, and it just hasn't happened that way. Um, and his, his, his offense is he's moving so far away from the rim. He's shooting more threes, which is, you know, everybody's doing it, especially now. But he's firing up way too many long mid-range shots and not attempting nearly as much at the rim. His average shot distance, got it right here, is 16 feet, which is essentially a free throw, which is up three feet from last season. His isolation frequency is up, meaning around the perimeter. His post-up rate is down. And his percentage of plays as the pick and roll roll man is not changed at all, which theoretically we thought that was going to be much higher. His defense is, you know, nothing's changed. He's still the same defender he was last year. Same, still grades out to be, the, you know, probably the best defender maybe ever. But there are signs of inability to figure out how to use Wemby on offense. He is a very unusual player in the fact that he can do everything. And figuring out how to use players like that at his size is not easy. And it feels like the Spurs don't have the answer for that yet. The Spurs, we just talked about them. Let's go north of the border. We're going to talk about the Raptors. They are very precocious. They're injured. They have no depth. They've gone to rookies, Jonathan Mogbo and Jamal Shedd. And they, and they look good. Jamal Shedd, obviously, a senior. He's been a positive contributor everywhere he's gone. Really cool to see him do it in the league. Uh, Jonathan Mogbo, if you don't know who that is, he, they picked him 31st in this year's draft. He's had a major impact as an energetic big off the bench. He's undersized, but, you know, he's got quick hands. He's a hard worker. He hustles his ass off. He's a quick ball mover, makes quick decisions, which is huge in this league. Of any player with less than 150 minutes right here on the season, he has the fourth most deflection. So when he's getting in there, he's making an impact immediately, especially on defense. Jamal Shad hasn't really shot the ball well. He's still probably adjusting to the NBA length and the speed of the game, but he's had a, he had a nine assist game against Charlotte, and he's been a reliable facilitator when he's been on the floor. Also, Grady Dick has been incredible, averaging, I believe, 20 points this season. I'm on a great efficiency. We've seen him attack the basket more, take more of the reins on offense. Obviously, Scotty Barnes, hope he gets back. Him being out with an herbal fracture, that's going to you know destroy this team's hope of even making a play in berth. But you're seeing a lot of guys step up and have to take on more of a major role. And, and again, building that is key in a rebuild. The Jazz are resolved. They're bad, finally. The last two seasons, they won too many games when they knew they weren't that really good of a team. And they had a chance to get generational prospects, or at least take a swing at them, and didn't. However, this season, they're bad. And they're tanking. They're in prime position to capture the flag, or sag for flag, or something like that. They're giving all their young guys as much time as they can. Uh, five, I'm looking at right here, five players aged 23 or younger are getting 15 minutes per game. That's obviously Taylor Hendricks' season-ending injury is going to give someone like John Collins more time. But even so, Utah is still skewing toward the younger players way more. Uh, Keontae George leads the team in minutes and shots, and he is super inefficient. You know, the first-time high-level point guard in the NBA, and they're last in offensive efficiency. So if you're Utah, let him work out the kinks. Get a generational player in Cooper Flag. He's going to get better, Kathy George, and the Jazz are going to struggle. It's a win-win. The Wizards, I don't want to say it too loud, they look promising. If you if you, if you you really look hard enough, Blal Kulubali looks like a star. Keyshawn George, defensively, he could be an all defense. Again, he's a guy that if you told me he makes five all-defensive teams, not shocked. And Alex Saar, I uh, don't know what he's going to be, but he hasn't sucked yet. And for the Wizards, your first year really in a rebuild, that should be more than enough. They spent so many years chasing the eight seed, paying for guys just to have a, a modicum of, a, of relevancy. But the fact that they're even showing and they're playing all these young guys, you know, I haven't even mentioned Bob Carrington, who looks, you know, he's made some strides. That's the real win for the Wizards. Even though Saar was the second overall pick, Koulibaly's the guy. He's the main guy in this rebuild to me. And he may not be to the Wizards, but he is to me. In his second season, I'm looking at it here, 18.6 rebounds on 61, 48, 70 splits. Again, three-point shooting is going to come down, especially if he's only a 70% free throw shooter. However, people forget... That's great. If he averages that for the rest of his career, that's a good player. He's a better defender. They're not going to get many wins this season, but I promise you if they continue to play these guys and continue to lean into the rebuild, good days will come. And that's everything. I just wanted to talk about each team a little bit. I'm probably going to do this maybe once a month, once every other month. Um, don't want to talk too much about basketball because I am, especially during football season, talking more about football. But basketball started. College basketball started. We're going to get to some college basketball soon. Yeah. If you guys enjoyed this, make sure to comment down below what you're going to see me do next. And uh, yeah, YouTube thinks you're going to like this video. Find out if they're right.